Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Malborn and I am the Executive Director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at Southern Oregon University. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, please type those into the chat or save them for the end of the talk. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest, Mariam Ghani, whose solo exhibition titled Partial Reconstructions opened this week. Mariam is an artist, writer, and filmmaker. Her work looks at places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible forms and spans multiple disciplines. Her films have screened at international film festivals, and her work has been exhibited and screened at the Guggenheim, MoMA, Matt Brewer, Queens Museum in New York, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., the St. Louis Art Museum, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, as well as internationally. Ghani received a number of fellowships, awards, grants, and residencies, most recently from the Creative Capital, the New York State Council of the Arts, the New York Library, the 18th Street Art Center in Los Angeles, the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. Ghani is known for projects that engage with places, ideas, issues, and institutions over long periods of time, often as part of long-term collaborations. These include critical curatorial conversation and creative work with the National Film Ar Archive, Afghan Films since 2012, with support from the media archiving collective Padma and a number of international art institutions. The video and performance series performed places ongoing since 2006 in collaboration with choreographer Aaron Ellen Kelly and composer Kasim uh, Nakfi and the experimental archive and discussion platform Index of the Disappeared. Initiated with artist Chichra Ganesh in 2004, which has also become a vehicle for collaborations with other activists, archivists, artists, journalists, lawyers, and scholars. Ghani's feature film, the award-winning and critically acclaimed documentary, What We Left Unfinished, premiered at the 2019 Berlinale. She is currently in production in her second feature titled Disease in 2020. She had solo collaborative museum exhibitions at the Blaffer Art Museum in Houston and the Speed Museum of Art in Louisville. Ghani teaches at Bennington College. Please join me in welcoming Mariam Ghani. Thanks, Scott. Um, it's always that fun little lag when you're unmuting on Zoom. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. This is a really nice turnout for the middle of the day, your time. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do, uh, and what I was asked to do, is uh, give you a, a sort of artist talk uh, with a with slide deck and we'll maybe try to play some video, although that's always a bit of a dicey proposition again over Zoom. Um, and what I'll do is, is talk to you, I'll give you, I'll give you a bit of context for some of the work that's in the show, um, including going into some of the process behind making some of that work and then also going into some other works that, that are related um, and kind of the broader arc of my practice. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, as I think you all probably know, the show at the Schneider Museum focuses on my work in and about Afghanistan over the past 20 years, but I thought rather than, you know, starting by speaking specifically about how those works relate to the idea or reality of Afghanistan right now, I would start by talking about how both my diasporic position, which is simultaneously intimate and estranged, both insider and outsider, and what I've gleaned from Afghanistan over this time have informed my work more generally. So as you mentioned, Scott, my practice is based on research into places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible and tangible forms. And what that looks like is you know, places like this children's playground, which is constructed from parts discarded by North Sea oil rigs in Norway or this migrant labor camp in the undeveloped desert outside the city-state of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I'm, under, I'm interested in understanding both how we reconstruct the past and the present and how we construct the present for the future through shifting private and public narratives. 
Sometimes this research leads me to construct a fiction or reconstruct a speculative history around documents or fragments, physical traces, or a sense of place. Uh, and that's what you know drives a lot of my work with choreographer Aaron Ellen Kelly and composer Kasim Nakfi on the series you mentioned, Performed Places. Um, this image is from a piece we made in St. Louis uh, based on the novel, The City and the City by China Mietville. Sometimes this research leads me to witness, document, intervene in or engineer a present day event or temporary space. And that's really what was going on with the piece Kabul Constitutions, which is in the show. And it's a project about um, and made from footage of the 2003 to four Constitutional Loya Jirga or Constitutional Assembly uh, in Afghanistan, which is where the, um, the constitution that, that was in force for, for much of the last 20 years was drafted and ratified. So this is a little picture. It's actually Rina Miri on the left who is Biden's current um, is the uh, uh, emissary to the Taliban. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to turn that down a bit so I can talk to you about this. But I forgot Rena was in this. Um, that's the, the UNAMA tent that you see on the left, which is the United Nations Assistant Mission to Afghanistan. They were they were administering various aspects of this assembly. And on the right, it was kind of the sequence that people go through when they were going into this tent complex where the assembly was held. None. And in the center, it's this series of uh, of delegate speeches happening in the plenary tent, which basically every provincial delegate was given three minutes, which was timed on a screen next to them to, to, to say anything they wanted about the problems of the country and specifically of their province if they wanted to, um, which is really a fascinating thing to watch. Um, and I think in general, the, the thing that I, I was really surprising to me about this assembly was how interesting it was and how lively and how much like a three ring circus. Uh, because I think often when you, you see documentation of, of processes like this, it's so linear that you lose all of that excitement of the contentiousness of it and the way in which so many people are working towards different outcomes at the same time um, in the, the need to make a linear narrative out of it um, that just shows how, you know, we got from A to B to C to the end, end result. Um, so what I did instead of making that kind of linear narrative was just organize everything spatially. Um, and part of that came out of my interest in uh, the idea of the architectures of democracy, which was a phrase that gets tossed around a lot at, at something like a constitutional assembly. People talk about the architecture of democracy quite a lot. And it struck me that we were, we were actually in an example of uh, an architecture that was built specifically for the construction of an architecture of democracy because it was a tent complex that had been built uh, to purpose to hold first the emergency loya Durga, where the in transitional administration was um, was put together and then this constitutional loya Durga, where the constitution was um, ratified uh, so i i did this slightly whimsical thing where I was like, let's map the, the assembly onto its space. Um, and in the installation uh, at the Schneider, it includes this architectural schematic of the tent complex, which is um, in the show uh, shown as a wall drawing. And then there's also a guidebook that gives you additional information about each segment of the video, kind of identifying people and processes 
which is again organized spatially. Um, everything runs from the top to the bottom of the map, basically, instead of running from the first day to the last day of the assembly. So some of my recurring preoccupations include border zones and no man's lands, translations, transitions, and the slippages where cultures intersect, security cultures, um, archives, architectures of democracy and national imaginaries, places where nature and artifice imitate and influence each other, and the intersections of war, trauma, memory, identity, migration, language, and loss. Um, I also work across multiple disciplines, but all my projects share a similar research-based approach and operate through a mix of similar narrative, a mix of documentary narrative and database forms. So this is a project I did at the Queens Museum of Art in New York, which is called the Garden of Forked Tongues. And it's a good example of a database form project where I accumulated a collection of materials around endangered languages. Um, and then developed several different interfaces to that collection, including a mural on the wall, where each polygon represented one language that was slowly or rapidly disappearing from the world, but still spoken in Queens, and had the word for tongue in that language written inside it. I also wrote an essay, uh, and then in collaboration with my brilliant student, Effie Eibach, um, who was one of my graduate students at the time, uh, created an online version of the project as well. And right now I'm currently working on a related uh, permanent public installation also about language. Afghanistan lexicon, the notebook and print portfolio is another good example of this method. It functions as part of the Documenta 13 notebook series as a standalone book, a companion piece to the installation A Brief History of Collapses, and a smaller set of prints that play with the look and forms of colonial era encyclopedias, late colonial era encyclopedias. And these are in the exhibition, as is uh, A Brief History of Collapses. In general, Afghanistan a lexicon uses the inherently variable and open structure of a lexicon to attempt a different kind of history writing, not linear, causative, or progressive, but circular and cross-referenced, tracing both individual narratives and the larger systems and structures that enclose them through an emphasis, again, on spatial politics and also poetics. It also makes room for rumor, speculation, and myth, and some passages of pure poetry, as well as facts. Um, I can read you this, this specific mm -hmm. entry, which I have been thinking about a lot lately, um, which is the entry on loss. Uh, over the past century, many things have been lost in Afghanistan. Battles, wars, soldiers, standards, ground, money, advantages, generations, blood, hearing, sight, limbs, lives, livelihoods, land, dreams, dreamers, ideas, ideals, innocence, friends, friendships, parents, children, childhoods, schools, teachers, homes, villages, fields, forests, rivers, roads, bridges, dams, electricity, cities, Monuments, paintings, poems, places, earrings, coins, keys, suitcases, maps, plans, plots, ways, means, sanity, reason, levity, proportion, judgment, balance, love, hope. Sometimes what was lost can be recovered, but more often the lost stays lost. So return to a brief history of collapses. Uh, this two-channel installation was originally commissioned for the 2012 Documenta, and it exploits the uncanny similarity between two buildings constructed two continents and centuries apart, the Museum Friedrich Saunum in Kassel and the Darlaman Palace in Kabul, to send two cameras on parallel journeys through their interiors, chasing two figures who constantly flee either the frame of the screen or the frame of the architecture. Um, one kind of fun note here um, is that actually the Darlaman Palace uh, was restored <laughs> like, after I made this piece. I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, for this film to distill two years of research into a 22 minute voiceover and to write these two histories in a nonlinear way that avoided drawing easy parallels between the buildings and cities 
and instead made more unexpected connections. I made this research map, um, which is a little crazy, but works for me. And then I used its idea trails to construct my text. So a little excerpt. from a brief history of collapses. The Brothers Grimm might have begun this story with there was once, and perhaps even added, and there will be again. Arabic folktales begin with the phrase kan ya makan, there was or there was not, implying that the story that follows may or may not have happened as told, or at all, or as yet. In either case, there rests a suggestion that time is not a purely linear construct, but rather something that bends around the events of the tale, or the storyteller's will. Which is to say that the past and future both inhabit the present, and history can be imagined not simply as a relentless forward march, but also as a hall of mirrors, a spiral maze, a path switch backing up a mountain, a door that swings back and forth on its hinges, or a dog endlessly chasing its own tail. In Afghanistan, folk tales begin with the formulation afsane sisane, which means that the story you are about to hear might be one of seven, or thirty, you could hear about the same events. If you wandered like a lost anthropologist around the countryside, asking the same question in different houses. You could also interpret this beginning to mean that every story, examined closely, is made up of other stories, which depend on other stories, which lead into other stories, and so on, branching and twisting into infinity. So, the story, or stories, you are about to hear, may or may not be true. They may have happened long ago and far away, or quite close to where you stand today, within the reach of present memories, or before the precisions of recorded histories. In these stories, books, among other things, are burned and banned and stolen and sought. So it is useless to pretend, while telling these stories, that words have no weight or consequences, or that myth never becomes history or history myth. Equally, it is useless to pretend that stories are told without intent, Every storyteller is Shahrazada, fighting to preserve either herself or the existence of something she values. So, there was once, or perhaps there wasn't, a palace. The palace was a parliament, or a museum, a library, or a refuge, a ministry, or a battleground. We can agree, at least, that it was and is a building, or rather two buildings, constructed two centuries apart. We may imagine that one building echoes the other, and we may be certain that each building contains its own echoes, the ghosts of what did or did not happen within its halls. These two buildings also share a curious condition. For those who know it best, the building exists in a state of suspension between what it was, what it is, and what it could be. Perhaps this is true of every building. Perhaps every building is a stone in the stream of history, around which it is possible to see the water's froth. Every building, then, is both object and process, and must be examined as such a physical fact that is constructed and reconstructed by circumstance. In the case of the Museum Friditianum, built across the line that once divided two communities. Okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna leave it there because obviously the video is in the show, <laughs> you can see it there. And it's more fun to see with two, two separate channels anyway. Um, and I'm gonna break down for you a little bit of how we made this, which was not easy. Uh, the film is all tracking shots and the camera's movements through the buildings, the speed of the shots and the placement of the cuts all had to be very, very carefully mapped out using architectural diagrams of the buildings. And when those couldn't be found for the Darlaman uh, palace, I had to draw them myself. Um, at the same time, the voiceover narration weaves back and forth between the histories and myths surrounding the two buildings and really between the actual and potential um, uh, buildings. And, and in many ways, the, the point of having this kind of floating camera, floating, constantly tracking camera was to, to try to navigate the, the potential buildings rather than the actual buildings in, in some way. Uh, so as I said, the, um, the uh, Darlaman Palace after after I made this, after I shot in the ruin of the Darlaman Palace, um, was actually restored. Um, and the, the um, engineering team that, that worked on the restoration actually watched my film while they were working on it as a reference point. Um, uh, not, not so much for the history, but just because by the time they started working on the restoration, 
most of the third floor had like completely fallen down. So it was a good record of what the third floor had looked like before it completely fell down. Uh, so you never know how useful your art is going to be or, or, or why or how it might end up being used. Um, uh, okay, so my long-term collaboration with Chitra Ganesh, which Scott also mentioned, um, ongoing since 2004 on the Experimental Archive Index of the Mysterious, has also touched on Afghanistan in various ways uh, because it's an inquiry into the human costs of post 9-11 US policies, both at home and abroad. Um, it looks at how the erasure, censorship and redaction of data conceals and enables real disappearances in real lives, detentions, deportations and renditions. Um, it also archives around the absences in official records, patiently outlining the gaps until we build up a picture of what's not there. For the first few years of the index, we were working directly with immigrant rights activists in the United States. And then as the archive expanded to cover the broader scope and deeper structures of the massive carceral regime of the so-called global war on terror, we began working primarily through and with documents like the ones you see here, from declassified government records to often contradictory first person testimony from witnesses, prisoners, and their families, collected by NGOs, lawyers, and journalists. In 2015, just before we began a residency at the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School, we decided to shift our tactics again to make our own images and conduct our own interviews about former Black sites. And our first in-person research trip, which was to Afghanistan, and that resulted in the Index's most recent body of work, Black Sites won the scene unseen. And this is what it looked like at the um, Asian Art Biennial in Taichung. And this is another view from the Dhaka Art Summit premiere. So, the term black site is currently understood to refer to a secret prison operated by the CIA as part of their extrajudicial rendition, interrogation and torture program active between 2001 and 2009. But any place that has been temporarily made invisible by tacit or explicit agreement to not see something that clearly exists can also be understood as a black site, including temporary holding zones used for extrajudicial interrogation, from home and square in Chicago to the forward operating bases deployed by the US military. Um, and these are some of the, the sites that we went looking for and found and didn't find at the same time. Um, uh, what happened with the photographs we and video we shot in Afghanistan is that we ended up redacting them. <laughs> um, and those became animated GIFs. The photographs became animated GIFs, which then became part of this film. Basically, we extracted redaction patterns and sometimes other graphic elements from documents in our index of the disappeared archive that were relevant to the places we photographed. Uh, for example, this is an aerial view of an area just off the road to Bagram before the plane that lies before the airbase in prison. And it's juxtaposed with redactions from sections of the 2014 Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Torture Report, referring to the CIA detention operations in Afghanistan, as well as a diagram of the tour jail taken from an Amnesty International report and based on the testimony of former prisoners. The exact location of the tour jail is still unknown and the building itself has reportedly been demolished, but most agree that it was just outside Bagram. Uh, another thing we were looking at with this series was the different visual regimes of redaction represented in the archive. And newly declassified documents are more likely to be redacted in white than black, as the government now believes it's more difficult to extract the redacted information from the document using predictive algorithms when redactions are white on white. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Meanwhile, the former site of the secret prison known as the Salt Pit, which is located in an industrial zone off the road between Kabul and Bagram, is still surrounded by triple layered barbed wire fences. This, at the time when we made this, it was still surrounded by triple layered barbed wire fences um, and manned guard posts, although the buildings that used to stand there had either been removed or moved underground. So the reason we undertook this redaction of our own images had to do with the dual experience we had in Afghanistan, some of which is encapsulated in the film we made. First of being just as frustrated by the physical sites as we had been 
by the redacted documents about them, finding the real places just as opaque and withheld from us, because in most cases they had not yet been released from the official regime of secrecy, even though they were effectively open secrets. Uh, second, we found that the images we were able to produce in and from these sites were also frustrating us because they seemed unfaithful, not to what we had seen with our eyes while we were there, but to what we knew from our years of research to be true about places that appeared to our eyes and camera to be empty or bland or unassuming. Um, so, for example, this is a telephoto photograph of the Hotel Ariana, which was the unofficially acknowledged CIA base station in Afghanistan until August 2021 and was likely also used as a temporary detention site for prisoners later dispersed to the black site network between 2002 and 2005. So these are also reduction patterns taken from the um, uh, SSCI torture report, um, specifically from page 169 and surrounding pages, um, which uh, allude to the um, quote unquote boxes of money presented to local government officials and considered as subsidy payments intended in part as compensation for support of CIA detention programs between 2002 and 2005. Um, again, this is a more official variant of the contract to look away from the things we did not want to see. So we felt that redacting the images actually made them more accurate by depicting not only the visible topography of these spaces, but their invisible topography as well, the ways in which they had been produced by particular regimes of secrecy, incarceration, and torture, and the ways in which they continued to reproduce various forms of those regimes even after the originating structures were removed. Um, so this is a photograph of an Afghan soldier on guard at the Parwan detention facility at Bagram Air Base, you know, the one that was abandoned. Um, uh, well before August. Um, and the prison, which is only a small part of the larger base, this prison was actually transferred from American to Afghan control in 2013, and the rest of the base remained under American control for many more years. Um, and these redactions were taken from standard operating procedures and correspondence for the detention facility when it was also still under American control. Um, and those were obtained by the ACLU through a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, each of these cites a paragraph and section of the Freedom of Information Act, giving the legal rationale for the removal of that information. So like my work with language and loss, my interest in erasures in the records and the real disappearances they enable and conceal, as well as zones of exception and spaces of persistent surveillance are tied in many ways, not only to the present day politics and policies of the US, but also to the present and past politics of Afghanistan. And that's some of what I retraced through the project of what we left unfinished, um, which is among other things, a feature film. And it also at one point was a number of exhibitions and live cinema events. And someday I would really love to do a book if I can, but we'll see. Um, it is currently streaming on Criterion uh, for individuals, and it is also available through Good Docs for educational users whose libraries have DocuSeek. If any of you have DocuSeek through your libraries, it is on DocuSeek. Um, here is the trailer. <laughs> I'm 
همان وقتی که ما و فلمار بازی میکردیم موجی میشدیم با دشمنای دولت ما خوند من بدیم ملاق زنده ما میموندن آلش خیلی دروغ بگه با گفته نمیتونستی که مثلا یک وقتی رو اگنی مویش کرده است و اگر میگه با میزیدی رو آسان زندان میشیدی پنی روز با میکنشن برد فیلمای خود تا به حال هم بیشتران بسیار جان آرام دارم آن چه واقعیت بده یا ای واقعیت شیرین بده یا ای واقعیت تلخ بده هر چی که بده ما فقط اونه تصویر ساخته ما با درموتوریکی فیلم خود اونه یک جا کرده So what we left unfinished is the product of a long-term collaboration with the Afghan Films Archive. Um, and uh, this has also resulted in the restoration of other films by the directors I interviewed. And the first two completed restorations are actually also going to premiere on Criterion in March. I think we do have time to look at this trailer, which we, I literally just finished like two days ago. Um, I'm very proud of this restoration. Um, Hang on, take a look. <laughs> رسیدم بر سر کوی شمالی نشستم گیه پرسو آس چرا کلا سر تمود میزنی؟ شریف می آیا I really wanted to share that with you because it makes me really happy <laughs> to know that that's, that's going to be on um, the Criterion channel. It was one of my life goals to 
to get more Latif Ahmadi's films on Criterion. Um, I think we probably don't have time to also watch the Dark Days trailer, but um, I, I can have uh, I can have them post the, the link for you. Um, it's also a really fabulous film that, and a restoration I'm really proud of. Um, okay. Um, so uh, in, in this process of, of making what we left unfinished and you know, all that has come after it, um, which included gathering together the remnants of these five unfinished films from the communist period, which is a time when film was a weapon and filmmaking a, a decidedly dangerous enterprise, finding the people who made them and then were scattered by war. Um, I learned a lot about archives. I learned a lot about Afghan history in and beyond the communist period, about Soviet influence in film across the region, about the left and non-alignment, the vagaries of exile, the political dangers of nostalgia, and even about my own family. There were points where I came across family history that had never actually been discussed with me. Um, and that was, that was quite something. Uh, I pulled on a loose thread in the history of Afghan films, the, the possible existence of five unfinished feature films. And it led me down a winding path through so many stories and half stories and obfuscations and evasions that I was still unraveling it five years later, having pursued it across four continents in the meanwhile. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that the um, there's a short film in the exhibition, um, which is really, it's like only two, two minutes. I'm not gonna show it to you here because it, I would show you the whole thing, not an excerpt, um, which, is, um, uh, which is called Follow the Leader. And there's also a series of prints from Follow the Leader in the exhibition, um, which are basically made from film leader, the, these sort of scraps of film. Uh, they're made from the, uh, the the material that is um, uh, at the beginning of a film before the film actually starts. So it's, it's used as references by projectionists. Um, they would um, put marks on them to know when to sync the sound and picture for editing or um, uh, to know when to change the reels when projecting on prints. So on negatives, the, the projectionist marks are for syncing sound and picture and on prints they're for knowing when to change the reels. Um, and Follow the Leader is made entirely out of these, these marks, these projectionist marks, um, uh, some of which are hand painted um, and some of which are, are mechanically printed um, that are from uh, the films I was working with um, in the process of making these restorations and in the process of making what we left unfinished. So they're all these material histories um, of, the, of the community of people. Um, uh, that I that I worked with and that I learned about in making that film. Yeah, that one wasn't supposed to be here. Okay, um, so that's how I work um, with public histories, with private narratives, with the gaps between them, and Afghanistan is a large part of why I work that way. So I'm going to stop the share now. Find my mouse again. Yeah, okay. That didn't stop the share, but it does let me find my mouse, great. Okay, here we are, all right. <laughs> and um, we have some time for questions if you all have any questions. <laughs> no. Thank you, Mariam. Um, everybody is invited to either type your questions into the chat, I can read them aloud, or feel free to Unmute yourself, um, share your video, and ask Mariam directly. I have a question, Scott. Hi, Alan. Yeah. Um, uh, Mariam, thank you so much uh, for giving us all of that history. Uh, it just sounds incredibly complex. <laughs> um, I'm um, uh, interested in, uh, from a uh, docent uh, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with regard to Kabul uh, constitutions and the Loya Jirga. Yeah. 
how you might summarize that annotated guide. Um, mm. I know that's like a huge thing to do, but <laughs> I'm just wondering um, how the uh, viewer can engage with that coming on it suddenly, having never seen it before, um, how, how they might get a sense of that theoretical architecture of democracy and how it overlaps with real spaces. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the guide is really meant to sort of suggest. Um, so the guide basically has a, a, a version of the map on its cover with numbers and each number kind of corresponds to one section of the guide. And then the guide will explain like what was happening in that space, um, what part of the process was unfolding in that space and kind of who was involved in it. Um, so it, it, it tries to decode the process a little bit. So the backstory of this is that when I first made this project, I made it as an interactive installation. This was back in um, 2005 when I was still making interactive work because, you know, I was usually in the same city as my as my work, which stopped happening shortly afterwards. You know, I had started having a more international career, and I was like, oh my god, international installation like interactive installations are a terrible idea when you have an international career. <laughs> Because they just break all the time. And if you're not there to fix them yourself, like it's, it's, they're just going to be broken for most of the show. So when it was originally made as an interactive installation, I gave guided tours of the map as a performance, mm -hmm. um, which was a way to get people to interact with it because people don't interact with interactive work unless you make them, right? Um, so I would come in every weekend and give guided tours of the map. So the guidebook was a version it, it was like a portable version of my personal tour of the map. <laughs> like, so it's basically everything I used to tell people when I would give tours of the map. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And when I would give tours of the map, we could actually trigger, like it was interactive, so we could trigger different parts mm -hmm. um, of the thing. And so I could just, I could like step on part of the carpet, which was the map was on a carpet. I could step on it and we would trigger that video to play and then I would tell people this is what's going on in this video. Um, so that's how that how it kind of evolved <laughs> into what it is now. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if that helps us kind of more complicated. <laughs> it's, it is a bit complicated. Um, uh, I'm going to try to put it in my own words by going through it and kind of abbreviating some of the mm -hmm. some of the material because I only have usually a limited amount of time to present. So I was just uh, curious about that. Um, and I had uh, one other question actually, um, with regard to, this is a simple one, mm -hmm. uh, Cabell, two, uh, Cab Cabell two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah. Do those read starting in 2002 from the top and then 2003 and then- I always forget, honestly, um, but oh. I think so. <laughs> I keep Hang asking on, myself that question. I don't know why it's important to me, but uh, Hang on, I'll look at it right like... now. I'll look at it right now and tell you because that is important to know. Um, but I, I actually always forget because it's, it's quite an old piece. Um, so let me look. There, there, there are times when I don't remember myself what's happening in my work. Okay. Um, mm -mm. Okay, let's open that up and see. All right. It is 2004, 2003, 2004 is on the top. 2004 is on the top. Yeah. 2003 in the middle. And, and 2002, 2002 at the bottom. Yeah. And the way you can tell is because there are way more barricades on the street in the top one. Uh huh. Like, so by the time, by 2004, this kind of security culture had taken over mm -hmm. the streets of Kabul. So there were actually streets I couldn't even drive down anymore um, because there were so many barricades and there were so many sandbags. And um, the, you, if you look at it sort of attentively, that's one of the things you can see. Another thing you can see is there's many, more finished buildings. So in 2002, there were a lot of buildings that were still in construction that by 2003 are finished. And then by 2004, they're like 
active commercial buildings. Also by 2004, all the buses had started running again. Um, so you can see buses on the street in 2004. Um, that's how I, that's how I can tell. Okay. No, uh, that's helpful because I'm not that familiar with the history. I'm getting familiar with it by doing my own research. Um, but like most Americans, we know nothing about Afghanistan, you know, except- No, I know. That is, that is how it, how it is. Um, the, uh, the other thing I'll say about Kabul constitutions is the left channel runs down the left side of the map. The right channel runs down the right side of the map. The center channel only shows things in the plenary tent, like mm -hmm. the, the main tent. And it's divided by like basically seating areas um, because the, the seating was, was assigned by your your role in the process which was actually really interesting right mm -hmm. like so all the foreign diplomats were in one seating area all the press was in one box all the like delegates were in one place all the um uh, people appointed by the government were in another place right so that's how i divided up the videos I, as well okay. um, and then there's a few extra things like i also filmed the people who were filming it for the live television broadcast <laughs> and then i filmed like the tea servers because i found them really interesting like there was this constant tea service um mm -hmm. and they were like they seemed to me to be the people who were paying the most attention to all the speeches um, <laughs> so i was curious about them you know yeah. and they were like well we've never left kabul again all of our lives and so it's really interesting to us to hear from all of these provincial delegates because we've never been out of kabul um you know yeah yeah so it's really fascinating to them like yeah i like what you said about the um, <laughs> about what was going on on the side as opposed to what was going on in the plenary that that all of those discussions on the outside were the reality and the other and that certainly for me in my mind it said yeah that's how democratic uh, organizations work that's the architecture of them you know yeah. it's these little uh, side rooms is what it happens yeah, like there's in, in the left hand side, you have all these kind of administrative spaces. So there was one where people were re reporting human rights complaints, for example. And then on the right hand side, there were like VIP spaces. So there were all these side deals being made in these VIP spaces. Mm -hmm. um, like I think I, I think I did manage to film one where there was like a little side deal that was made about like the national languages, right? which is... <laughs> <laughs> like how many national languages there would be, um, which was a very contentious issue. Also the national anthem, how many languages the national anthem would be in was like a surprisingly bitter fight, right? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, any other questions from our participants? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mariam, do you have any recommendations for students who may be interested in going into research-based art? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there has been a fair bit, um, uh, like it, recommendations in, in what sense, like of, of artists to look at or, or things to read or like places to go, because the best like there are some really good practice-based PhDs for research-based art in Europe that are fully funded, <laughs> which is the first thing I would recommend. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, um, mostly in uh, mostly in Scandinavia, um, weirdly, and then I think there's one in Scotland. Um, but uh, yeah, it's they're really nice. <laughs> it's like five years of funding to just make wow. art like it's pretty awesome um <laughs> that is impressive <laughs> so, yeah thanks Mara. we'll look into that <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from our uh, participants i have i mean it's kind of questions and comments um want to say thank you for like just taking the time to do this research and these 
these projects are really important. You kind of embody one of my favorite quotes from Edwin Land. He says, don't take on a project unless it's manifestly important and nearly impossible. <laughs> it kind of, you kind of embody that. You know, I wonder too, like a lot of history informs your work. Do you ever think of how to make a body of work that would kind of break that cycle that you talk about of reform, revolt, collapse, recovery? Like what would that look like? Um, and then I know not to make it a, more of a question, but you kind of talked about in the brief history of collapses, thinking about architecture through the movement of bodies through space. And I'm like, woo, talk about that a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Can. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, most of the work I make with Aaron, um, Aaron Kelly is, is, yeah, is, is sort of like dancing about architecture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, some of it's dancing about landscape, but a lot of it's dancing about architecture um and that's that's that perform places series which i didn't really get into in this talk but we've made uh we've made work together since 2006 we've made quite a lot of of pieces in a lot of different places um and uh we are very influenced by landscape archaeology as a as a kind of disciplinary approach um and, and thinking about how to um how to approach places along three axes. So um, taking every site, looking at its historical uses, um, it's how it's understood in the contemporary context, and then what it's like to be a body in that place. So what is the phenomenological experience of that place? And then trying to represent all three of those things in the work. Um, and um, the other question, <laughs> um, I mean, I think I've, I've, I've said this before, like, I don't, I don't know how much art can do, right, on its own. Like, I, I think there's a limit to like what art can do. I, at the same time, you never know what art will do when you make it. Um, and that's the kind of beautiful and, and strange thing about being an artist. It's like you make work, you put it into the world, and then it goes on these really bizarre trajectories that <laughs> that are that are very unpredictable um, and and touch people you never expected and land in places you never expected um and that's that's the amazing thing um so yeah i don't i don't i i don't know um i don't know if i don't know how afghanistan breaks out of that that mold out of that pattern. Um, I mean, because we're in it again right now, obviously. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm working on very, very hard right now is trying to get artists out um, and find ways to support artists who can't get out with, with, you know, education and mentorship. You know, so artistic tradition isn't totally interrupted again. That is one thing that, like, I've been thinking about quite a lot there was such an intense interruption of artistic tradition during the last Taliban regime. There was like a whole lost generation of artists, right? Um, and so one thing we're really thinking about is like, how do, how do we stop that from happening again? Um, and what kind of structures can we put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again? Um, but yeah, there's definitely, there's ways to help with that if people are interested. Thank you, Maram. We we are reaching uh, beyond that time. If it's okay with you, maybe we'll just check with our participants if there were any other thoughts, questions, or comments. Mm -hmm. Hey, Miriam. This is David hey, Humphrey. Good. How are you? It's good to see you again. Nice Thank you so here. much for allowing us to be able to exhibit your work. It's, it's just extraordinary work. And thank you for um, speaking with us today. Um, our only hope is we wish we could have gotten you here um, and to visit Southern Oregon, but maybe in the future we can do that. But it's great seeing you and thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you, David. I'm really glad we could get, get the show up at least. Thank you. Any other final thoughts, questions from anybody?
If not, uh, Mariam, thank you so much uh, for your time today and sharing your work. Uh, we are excited to share what we have in our galleries with our audiences, and we will be in touch soon, okay? Thanks, everybody.